All right. All right, so we are live now. Uh, thanks for joining, Maria Alatsunji, joining from Lagos. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining. And um, let's have others join. Let's have others join. We're expecting our speaker to come on board now. Come on board. So this is the third week of the scholarship program for the Bash 2. And um, it's been a wonderful one so far. And okay, so the first week they were privileged to have someone come from organizations such as Olam to talk about inventory and financial management in aquaculture. And the second week, we, we discussed about the academy certification and um, the course is generally how they are fearing with the course. But today we are having one of the top mentors in aquaculture. Yes, he's a farmer and an aquaculture technical advisor based in Ghana today with us to come and share on the topic aquaculture value chains and opportunities for youth in Africa. So uh, briefly, can I welcome you, sir? Mr. John, how are you doing, sir? Hi, Paul. I'm fine. How are you? Hello, Mr. John. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Hello. Uh, I can hear you. Can Mr. Can you? John hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Can you hear me? My microphone seems to be working. Hello. All right, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. All right, thank you very much, sir. So that was a bit of internet delay. And um, as I said that, yes, how, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great, by his grace. And you? All right, so uh, can you just briefly tell us about your history on aquaculture so far? How did you start? And... Um, how did you get to where you are today? You know, we met at the World Aquaculture Society conference. For you to have come from Ghana to Nigeria for this kind of conference, it means you are a top influencer in the industry. So let us meet you, sir. <laughs> uh, thank you. Hello. Good evening, everybody. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, wherever you may be watching from. Um, I started as uh, farming fish maybe some nine years ago 
um, I started from the corridors of the university and um, eventually got out into industry. Um, in industry, I went in as a fresh newbie, starting to grow fish with um, my farm, Pillbrook Aquatics. I joined it as a as an assistant farm manager, eventually got to manage the farm, and um, today I own the farm. So uh, this has been me. And along the lines, also I do works with other farmers. Um, I like to share information. So getting into industry in Ghana, I realized that not a lot of farmers were talking to each other. So I went in wanting to to solve that. And part of the issue is that. Um, I'm coming in as a newbie. I had no prior experience. So to be able to navigate this industry well, I have to learn from those who have been in it. So that was one of the best reasons why I had to um, go out and talk to farmers. And now I I apply my trade somehow um, with other farmers talking to me and asking ideas. And I also ask people ideas. So that's that's what I do. Samuel, are you there? Well, uh, it appears we are having a okay. All right, uh, we can still hear you, sir. Okay, yeah, uh, I don't know at what point I, I, I lost you guys. Alyssa, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm audible. Yes, yes. It was a bit of network delay. I don't know yeah. why. Maybe because of the rain. That's why. Okay. We don't have a very good weather here as well. So. All right. Uh, yes, I can. I can hear you. I can hear you. Yes, I can hear you, sir. You can go ahead. Okay. So um, today I think I've been uh, invited to talk about aquaculture value chains and uh, opportunity for youth in Africa. And... Um, I wasn't sure about what format it would take, whether it would be a slide, whether it would be a question and answer segment, but um, I just prepared for both just in case. So as I've been, I've introduced myself, I'm a farmer first of all, and I am an, um, I'm an agriculture business advisor as well. I do that on the side of so as I learn the ropes, I share that with farmers as well. So if you talk about value chains, um, it usually would be explained as um, any activity or all the processes that are involved in um, creating a product or a service around an industry or along a value chain. And on the streets or in the farmers' terms, I like to call it anything that you do that generates value along a product or a service line. So take it as you using hook and line to catch fish, Take it as you even selling that hook. You take it as um, the guy mending the net. Take any activity that um, you can make money off in terms of uh, um, uh, the value chain. Then all of those activities that you do are, are so candidates are for um, value chain activities. Okay. Yes. Now, now if you want to look at um, the value chain opportunities that exist within aquaculture. 
Um, they are numerous. However, we tend to focus ourselves mainly or largely around um, fish farming, um, maybe processing. And that, um, that is so because mainly that is what the universities teach us. That is what the, the uh, um, capacities are set up to do. And therefore, we come out, we either want to be, either we want to be the teacher uh, himself or herself, but these days, there's usually um, a constraint on public sector employment, so we can all become teachers. So the next thing we do is we want to be farmers because we went to the school farm while we were in school, and therefore we have learned to grow fish. So that's the immediate thing we want to become, or we want to do some post-harvest processing. Again, that, do, that is a new thing of post-harvest technology. Again, that's the new thing that is coming up within the academia, and that's what we have hands-on training on. But then there's a lot, there's a vast of opportunity that you can, you can do along the value chain. Let's take um, and building bottom up with the uh, value chain, let's take input, input to, uh, supply. You can go into seed production. Uh, in Ghana, there's been a point where between uh, 2011 and 2015, we had so many uh, hatcheries coming up. And that was because those, as the industry grew, that, was the, that became the bottleneck of the industry. People had cages that they wanted to fill and they just could not have sufficient um, fingerling. And you know how farmers, especially the, um, the very, not very trained ones, they do not have a full, they do not have a, um, a full planned out stocking regime for their fish. So they turn up and they call you that they want fingerlings in one week or in two weeks. Um, they, I mean, a good, a good time frame to give somebody is a month, but then these guys will call you that they want it in, in one week or in two weeks. In fact, I still do that somehow, but that is only when um, I'm unable to uh, um, stock. And usually you know you are unable to get supply to fit your stocking on the last minute. Okay. So hatchery operators or hatchery produ producers should revolve around this, this, this time. And we had so many hatcheries coming up in Ghana. They made a bit of money, but they did not vertically integrate very well, or they did not um, set up their um, marketing very well, and therefore they usually have production clouds. Mm -hmm. Now, but that is an opportunity, definitely. It's a, it's a very easy start. If you have your infrastructure set up very well, it's a very low cost um, equation to, to start with. Then you have the feed input production. Uh, too many times you have farmers that come into the business and they say, ah, our feed is so expensive and therefore we want to start making our own feed. Um, and uh, I have had thought to advise farmers again that, and this is very controversial, coming from a guy who went for wish and um, promotes soy, soy um, protein in animal feeds, okay. But Fish farming is not the same as um, aquaculture. Uh, fish farming is not the same as poultry. In poultry, you could prepare your poultry mash, give it to the birds, and then they'll eat it all. But with fish, it has to be pelleted. If you want to keep your water quality very well, it has to be extruded. It's a whole lot of process. It goes through that. Just so much technicality that a farmer cannot focus on. And therefore, I still advise farmers to buy um, commercial feeds instead of make farm farm made feeds. Okay, it's it's cheaper in the long run to, to just buy commercial feed. The rates are much lower, and um, it just takes all that stress away from you. Then, um, so it's another area where um, 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 people could go into feed production, and I'm very glad it's Nigeria that I see that there's so much dominance in. Um, in feed production. I've seen local local um, players in the feed space. They don't have big extruders, they don't have big setups, but then they make uh, floating feeds and they make some good quality feeds. And I, I'm really proud of uh, Nigeria for, for being able to do that. In Ghana, we are 
100% very, very industrial, very commercial side kind of type of feed production. But in Nigeria, I've actually seen um, uh, a number of feed um, brands that are just people that have a low cost setup and then target uh, very small market to make sure that they are meeting availability to these farmers. And then you have the fish farming itself. So these are the people who are producing table size fish. They are producing fish for consumption. And um, uh, uh, this is that is this is the, the the stage at which I come in. I, that is the space in which I play. I I typically do um, uh, um, table size. In my case, I do more of tilapia. Um, I do catfish from time to time, but uh, catfish is not as big as it is in Ghana, as it is in Nigeria. But um, yeah, I think we are getting there. And along the value chain, that is where you have the highest concentration of players. Uh, because everybody in Ghana, for instance, everybody was, was told that oh, there's so much money in fish farming. And um, which was true at the time, I don't know if it's still true now, but then it, it's, uh, it's profitable, but not just as people found it to be. And also it comes with a lot of hard work and investment. Um, with catfish, it's relatively low cost to set up because you can have, you can do these things backyard, you in sampling tanks, try to get your feet wet with it. If you think this is what you want to do, then you can expand your production to um, as much as hectare points um, or even cages. It is not that um, easy to go um, to go small scale with tilapia, but yeah, in catfish you can really do that. Then uh, you go along the value chain. You have the logistics. Uh, logistics here refers to as the guys that do the post harvest. Um, um, provide the post-service services. So be transport. It can be transporting fingerling. It can be uh, producing eyes. It can be um, just putting the bits and pieces, having crates for rent for pe to people. And I'm saying this taking tilapia as a model. If you take catfish, for instance, it could still be seen. You could still have live transfer of catfish from... Um, from the uh, production side to the um, to the consumption side. For instance, in Nigeria, you are big on having point and kill, and point and kill have to be done with live catfish most of the times. So you can modify your your, your car or your trailer just to be going around farms, being paid to go around farms and then uh, load up these fishes and bring them to the consumption sites, um, um, still in good quality and ice production, for instance. And uh, in Tilapia, we are big on ice, okay? Now, if you look at ice production, it's one sector where people do not really see the value in, but I must, I can tell you that it's, it's an aspect that is very lucrative. Um, imagine that uh, the standard for, the standard for, um, preserving fish is to have a kilo of ice to a kilo of fish. And if a farmer is going to harvest, say what, um, a ton of fish or two tons of fish, he needs um, a ton of ice. In our case, we probably may not necessarily do a ton of ice, but we probably would do uh, uh, even half a ton. And half a ton of ice, and if you price it appropriately, that's that's a very good margin that you can you can make do with. And imagine that you are providing ice for just an enclave of where you live. Um, so I'm familiar with Ibadan. I'm a familiar with uh, Abekuta. Just imagine that um, you are one of the ice producers around Abekuta, and people need to transport their catfish or their slapia keep it well preserved and they are buying ice from you. I mean, that's, that's, that's a cool space to play in. Okay, and I advise that. I know energy, the energy aspect might be uh, one of the challenges, but it, it, it can always be traversed. Then we come to post-harvest handling. These are the people that are doing um, 
all the gutting. These are people who are putting their eyes on it, doing all the packaging. These are people who are making sure that the fish stays very well, they harvest it. So I saw out in Alabama, in their catfish industry, where the farmer does, is not the one who does the harvest. There's a whole team of people, and it's probably about what, six to eight guys. They come out with tractors. There's a, a crane on it, and they have a little boat. They have um, essentially like a winch that is winching the net out. And these guys' specialty is to come in into like a multiple hectare pond and harvest fish for the farmer and then take it to the processing um, plants. And I think we are eventually getting there where um, um, as, as we, we invest into our businesses, we are going to get a lot more mechanized and people who just want to specialize in that. They come in, uh, you pay them a, um, a certain amount and they do all the harvesting for you and um, you just sit down and have your buyer pay you your money. Okay, so we should keep looking at this space or we can keep looking, um, we can go in and develop it ourselves. I think the, um, the, the block making or the block manufacturing um, uh, space, for instance, there were times where if people wanted to build houses, they would mold their own blocks. The, um, you go in, mold your own blocks and have your mason come and build those houses for you. We've got to the point where we we got to a point where masons or builders didn't want to get involved with that anymore. So they just um, outsource that to a block making factory. And these days, and even in our respective countries, it's become a very big business where people just go in. There's already made blocks, even with concrete work. There's already preforms. They just go ahead and buy the slabs they need, and that's it. They don't have to wait, uh, spend time again doing these things. So I think we'll get to the point where all these aspects of our production or put harvest handling activities, we can outsource it to people. And when we are accessing, guess who is going to be available to catch that opportunity? It's going to be the guys that have positioned themselves along that sector to grab opportunities like that. And imagine that within a week you are going to, you can have maybe three, three to five, or maybe 10 farms lined up to have a stuff for them. And that's, that's probably a good value we are going to be making out of that. Then we come to post harvest processing itself. Uh, post harvest processing, and um, again, Nigeria plays the lead in when it comes to catfish smoking. And I've seen some pretty good work um, on the internet and even on the ground in Nigeria of people uh, smoking catfish very well and the market is pretty good in, in um, Nigeria. Is that the only product we can do? Um, I guess there's so much more we can do. So in Ghana, for instance, there's somebody I know who does cat, um, tilapia and catfish sausages uh, does keep up out of these things. And there's so much. Uh, I think the, uh, I've also seen the Lagos Appeal um, program that sponsors some processing aspect, which I think that we need to take this knowledge and quickly decentralize it, quickly run with it. Because um, if it was elsewhere in an advanced country, immediately these product lines come out. People are just going to get the, the patents of them and straight away swing into action. And as our income level increases, believe it or not, there are just going to be Africans who would say they no longer want to eat food. They want to eat play. They want to eat um, um, uh, canned, canned catfish or canned slavia. So this, this would improve. Okay. So, and then we come to marketing and distribution. This is one very big and promising space that I think we are not taking enough advantage of. And that is because, you know, there's this thing around marketing that a lot of people do not want to get involved with the idea of selling. And uh, it's the weakness for a lot of people. But you know that there is value where not so many people are playing. In. And I think that uh, if we begin to cycle our mind, we begin to 
create a distribution network of people who can take off take what um, 20 kilos, 50 kilos, 100 kilos of fish for mass on a weekly basis, then we create those network. Imagine that you are able to create a network of what 20, 30, 50 people that are doing that within the week, then that is not too good. That is very good for you. Okay. So it's um it's a big marketplace. Please excuse me, just give me a second. Okay, sorry about it. So, um, if you are able to create these distribution channels very well, then there are a lot of opportunities there as well. So, if you took, um, for instance, Nigeria, your you are a population of several millions, I think 150 million or more, somewhere. And if you look at catfish, your your production and consumption is very dominant in southwest and maybe south south and uh, a bit of southeast. But you ask yourself, what about going up north? Is the distribution very well done there? Okay, so there are opportunities there that you have to look out for. Um, look oh, okay, so. Look at your neighboring countries as well. Just, just try to make sure that every space. It's like Coca Cola. You take how the business model of Coca Cola. Ensure that every intersection. They ensure that every intersection or every gathering of human beings there must be a Coca Cola there. So if we have this kind of approach, then that means that there's so many communities that we have to ensure that we have um, fish or some derivative of fish product there and uh, if we do our distribution very well i know africa is a very tough terrain to traverse when it comes to logistics moving product from one point to another but um um if we are positioning ourselves very well if our roads are getting better we would immediately take advantage of these um um uh, these opportunities then there is the knowledge transfer aspect. And this is where uh, a lot of us also like to play because, again, it's our comfort zone. Okay, so this is essentially consulting. People, and you, you have somebody grows fish one or two times and becomes a consultant to other farmers. And we have had so many farmers lose money out in consulting business. Okay. And, Mm -hmm. But um yeah, it's it's it's, it's a space that we can play with. You know what I'm doing, I guess, yeah. I'm gonna get feedback from you. Somewhere, I'm getting feedback from you. Take mm. a two and all right, I was getting feedback from you. Okay, so um, in consulting, nevertheless, consulting is still a viable business that people can go into. Um, it be doing it on behalf of the government, being paid as an, a government extensionist or a university extensionist or doing it in private practice. And I've seen that pick up very well, even in Ghana, because um, a lot of young people go in, for instance, they can do, um, Hatching, catfish hatching for people um, who necessarily do not have that skill and then make uh, a margin out of it. There are also people that would consult on all various aspects, be it the business management aspect of it, be it the marketing aspect of it. There's so much wealth of knowledge that you can always transfer to the farmer or to other players along the value chain. And then there is content creation. This is 
you'd see so many um, YouTube channels promoting aquaculture and demonstrating aquaculture activities on, 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 on the internet. And um, apart from the fact that they are able to attract some um, advertisements, uh, they also promote their services and have a lot more people reach out to them for business. They also get, um, um, I think they, they, they make money off YouTube by providing content for YouTube as well. And there is the technical aspect where you can do environmental impact assessment. Again, that's a form of, of, of consulting. You can do it for, um, and then even land reclamation. So in mining organizations, they are done with mine pits and they are looking on how to reclaim these lands. And there have been ideas as to whether all these waters that collect in the mining pits, aquaculture could be a means to help reclaim those lands. Um, we are still dealing with the issues of the heavy metals, but I think that potential of aquaculture being a tool to reclaim those lands exists and we look forward to exploring all of those gaps um, with the necessary technicalities as well. Then we have uh, fish health diagnosis. So it's something that is not pronounced in Nigeria, but in Ghana, because of our disease history in the last um, five to seven years, uh, fish health has become um, uh, forefront in our industry conversation. So we are beginning to have a lot of people that are positioning themselves in that space where they are building their capacities to be able to make quick um, diagnostics for people, like turn around, um, have very fast results to the farmers. Some of these results, um, tests can even be on farm and farmers are happy to pay for this. I always say farmers are happy to pay for results. And as long as you are giving the farmer um, results uh, of what to do, you are telling him this is what is available, this is how to solve it and those things. He's happy to um, pay the value of that. So that's that's cool. And then there's also the business advisory aspect. It's so quite a new segment where people are getting into because if you look at a typical consulting business or a typical business advising business, they may understand agribusiness as a whole, but they do not understand the aquaculture value chain. And therefore, they have a lot of limitations in that, that line. But um, we are getting there where uh, a, few farmers, a few people that have farming background, like I do, um, are able to get in and uh, do some business advisory for farmers. Because we need farmers to move away from that notion where um, you are farming, farming to feed your family, you are farming to feed yourself, that kind of subsistence level of thinking. We want to move away from that and have farmers see their operations as a business and therefore they have to, their activities have to line up as a business would operate. So these are the, in a nutshell, the uh, opportunities I think exist in um, the aquaculture value, space, uh, value chain and uh, it's not exhausted, it's not an exhaustive list. I'm not sure anybody can exhaust this list because as time goes uh, on, um, some of these opportunities may diminish and new or whole new opportunities will arise as well. Do we have any questions about this before we make progress? All right, so um, then I'll go on to talk about the, um, the, the graduate comfort zone. So the graduate, graduate comfort zone is something we have termed um, based on what the trends we see from people that are coming out from industry, uh, coming out from, from, from academia. So what they usually do is that they want to hang around the consulting business, um, the knowledge transfer space, they want to hang around um, being farm technicians, farm managers. And these are very good places to start with. Or they want to tool the line of, of research. They want to work with the research organization or, or even with the university. The, the bottleneck with this is that there's not so much opportunities around to, to opportunities to go around with. And if you take the universities, for instance, imagine that uh, 
you are having um, even 10 people being retained, each year being retained from the universities. Um, that would be good, but it's definitely not practicable. Therefore, um, people need to look to go private. Uh, farm out our businesses grow. Um, definitely farmers would want to get that high level of, of, of um, human resource. And one of the things I have always advocated to farmers is that hire qualified, uh, educated people to manage your farms because aquaculture business is not cheap. It's resource-based. It's a lot of capital that you sink into it. And um, most of the times, especially in Ghana where we do cage culture, people go to their community that they have their farms in and just hire somebody who used to be a farmer because they think he used to be a farmer, he has handled fish, so he should be able to do fish farming. This is somebody who is not very good at record keeping. Um, he's, he's, he doesn't even know how to find um, information if he needed it. This, is, this has been bottleneck for people. So you have people who take $100,000 or more investing in aquaculture and they complain that they don't get anything out of it. And I think partly it's because the the, the labor force we use is skilled and are trained and we need to move away from that. And therefore I advocate that at least every farmer should have one, uh, one or more graduates on their farm, just helping to um, look at, stay their face of it. And if they have issues, they know who to call they still have their university connection. They have their classmate connection that they can call and say, hey, guys, this is what I'm seeing with my face and blah, blah, blah. And they can get a quick solution to resolve. So, um, yes, farm, farm management positions is one aspect that um, graduates are beginning to hang on. Uh, however, my question is, must these three um, spaces be where graduates must, must, must be? The answer is no, because the value chain is wide. And if all of us are going to focus on um, farming or staying as a farm manager or working as a consultant, working at the university, if we are not able to push the product out into consumption, then these businesses are not going to be sustainable to be able to keep our jobs on. And therefore, we need a lot more graduates going into the marketing space, going into the distribution space. I know it's a difficult terrain, but... If people, um, the market women who probably you complain about every day uh, are unschooled, uh, untrained, and yet they've been able to be successful in this space, what shows that we cannot, if we know how to inject a bit more technology into it, why can't we do it and do it even better? So I think we need to have a lot more um, graduates confront the affairs and then go into um, marketing, going to distribution, going to logistics management. And in so doing, our product quality would even improve because um, as it stands now, to be able to get EU certification for our products, it's, it's, it's quite hard because of um, all this um, certification or all this um, uh, standards and requirements that we are required to meet. The best people to be able to meet those requirements are people that have the know-how, people that have some formal education to be able to approach this. So um, uh, these are the opportunities that I see would happen in uh, the next phase of our development. And how do we change this, this narrative? We need to give the um, uh, aquaculture practice, the students or our young uh, graduates or even uh, those doing short courses, we need to focus a lot more on um, short course or practical trainings. And I know that's what one of the uh, strength of this academy. I know that's one of the strength of uh, um, a whole lot of organizations. So even for which these are some of the things that we do provide like hands-on training, short training for people because you know that. Farmers usually do not have the time to have like a whole year run of training, a course or training or even more. It's, it's, it's difficult. But if you have very short, targeted, um, concept-wise trainings, then this would go well. And then also, I advise that young people should start small. Focus on a niche market. Do not pay attention to all the market leaders and where they are at the moment. Just 
start small, focus on the niche market, on a, on a, a small area, just focus on meeting the fish needs of 10 or 20 people and um, grow from there. Okay. And of course, they need a lot more industry and food, food trips to give them that exposure. The, so, um, uh, having exposure comes with imagination. You have to help. The exposure helps people broaden their imagination. How do you imagine something that you haven't seen? That's that's difficult. But if these people, while in school or while under training, have been exposed to so many value chains, see what works elsewhere, then they are more inclined to come back to put that into practice. So I think this brings my presentation to a close, and I'll take any questions that are available. Hello, Samuel. Hello, Samuel. I'm done. Hello, Samuel. I'm done. All right. Thank All right. Thank you very much, sir. That was a very, very profound session so far. You know, uh, I believe the viewers learned a lot about some value things such as um, Harvest. You know, Post Harvest is a brand in which is into both processing and preserving fish products. For instance, now, you know, a lot of people don't know the differences between processing and preservation. And, you know, that is one of the things we are dealing with even in our premium classes processing and preservation, one of the key areas that you can start small and um, grow into the rest, you know. Starting small, we will need you to maybe have just an oven that can serve about 500, 500 smoked fish. Then from there, you can grow. See, so these are a lot of opportunities for youth in the sector. We have the archery, we have the um, grow-out sections. You have to just identify either you want to be in the logistic chains, you know, there are a lot of value chains in aquaculture, either you want to be an affiliate marketer, you can even be an affiliate marketer, be in between the manufacturer and the consumer, you know, yeah. these are these are opportunities that are very, very real in aquaculture business. And um, in aquaculture sector, a lot of a lot of growth has been happening and you just have to find a niche market. Just as the way um, our speaker has said, you just have to find a niche market. You don't have to rush it big, you know. Just find somewhere you can just grow small, start small and grow into. All right, so um, I have this question for you, sir. Maybe just in the next five minutes so I can answer for us. On where, how did you start? On which part did you start um, in aquaculture? You said you started about seven nine years ago. That was a long time, you know. A lot of us might have not even heard about the opportunities in aquaculture. But then how, how did you start? Maybe in the next five minutes, just share with us a few step by step. Did you face any challenges? What kept you going that you spent over nine years still in the game of aquaculture? Okay, so I started in the um, the farming space, the fish farming space. Okay, now when I came out in the fish farming space, one of the biggest challenges, um, the very first year probably we did not struggle to sell fish because there's always this big buyer that would come out with a like two trucks and then buy everything you had. The market was good. We got to the point where um, they've been like foreign dominance in um, 
um, in our space, the production started growing much bigger, but the market were not developed into taking it. So we started struggling to sell our fish. And this is um, a space where I did not have formal training in how to sell fish. And I do not, I, I, you know, most of us, the art of selling, we just do not have. So you realize that that becomes a bottleneck. Yeah, essentially at the mercy of the buyer. And I had to learn all of this all over. Just say that there has to be something wrong. You have to be cross-cutting across the value chain. You. So we started small, targeting just few communities. So we started something we call the van sales, where we harvest and then we go out within the week and then we are just selling with the megaphone on our van. And uh, yeah, so we could push out what half a ton, maximum 800 kilos within a week. It was a slow start, but we, we just kept going. And that's how one of the aspects in which we managed to traverse our um, our um, our marketing aspect. But then there are so many things. I've been a bit, done a bit of work also in facial diagnostics as well, um, where I I worked as an agent for um, uh, fish diagnosis business, fish red group, where I talked to farmers trying to promote fish health to them. At a time where farmers were not have seen a lot of diseases, they they usually would turn it down. Like, oh, I'm not struggling. Any problem I have, I just use salt or I just use antibiotics, and then it ends. But we've got to the phase where um, people people are getting much bigger problems than just applying antibiotics and salt. And therefore, it's become a, a good demand. Facial diagnosis has become a good demand. Then um, these days, what I have also done is to learn the business ethics and uh, financial management of, of, of farming. And uh, this is one of the things I teach the farmers because you realize that um, as, a, as a technical person, you go into a farm to try and help them navigate out of their problems. You are not a magician. You need records. You need the history of what has gone on to notice what went wrong and turn them away for that. And when they do not have record, it's just difficult where to start from. So now we have to go back and tell farmers the importance of keeping records. And then when we do these training simulations with them, they see how everything fits into. So for instance, an accountant preparing your income statement or your balance sheet needs these records to be able to do that. And a consultant making you um, a business proposal to apply for some funds somewhere needs this information. And therefore, there is nowhere you can go without information, even to, to do your market targeting very well, even to do your, um, uh, um, how, how do you call it, to sell your product very well, you need to have these records. And as long as we are not having these records, it becomes difficult to be able to sell uh, effectively, effectively because how hard is it to sell big size fishes? It's your record that would show you that. How easy is it to move melange into the market? It's your business that would show you that. And based on these um, um, records, then it helps you target your market very well, even if you want to branch into um, um, value addition, other value additions. Uh, this um, would have given you the, the pointers in order to move in the direction you want to go. So yes, this is what I've been doing for the nine last nine years. Um, it's not a straightforward journey uh, to all aspects of the several aspects of the value chain, but I mo mainly revolve around producing fish. Samuel, I think I lost you there. Okay, so while before we have Samuel come in, we can just talk a bit about um, 
about marketing, for instance. So for university students or people that are home and not having um, jobs, how about you considering maybe a grill stand or going to partnership with somebody to manage a grill stand? So the person is probably the chef doing the grilling for you. Yours is to go out and meet farmers and then use your reputation or use your capital to get what um, some kilos, maybe 10 kilos, maybe 50 kilos, maybe 100 kilos of fish and bring it to half and give it to one or two grill stands and then they can manage, they can grill these fishes and create value out of it. How about that? How about going out, seeing households? And again, when it comes to catfish, I don't know in Nigeria, but in Ghana, people um, quite of, kind of despise um, um, catfish because it's a bit difficult to prepare it very, to clean it very well. How about if you can have that service provided to households, just tell them that, look, we'll clean this household of all the slime and then we'll supply you 10 kilos every, every week. Or if you buy fish once a month, we'll supply you this amount a month. Just start from your neighborhood and start picking fish and then retailing to these people to ensure the continuity of it. And these are little spaces that um, you can start from. Uh, you probably might not make money in your first year of operations, but it will give you exposure. People would know you, and who knows, somebody might call you out there and tell you, hey, we want you to be our affiliate marketer, or we want you to be the face of our brand in, in, in this, this town or in this community. And that might be some space that something that can be very revolutionary for you. All right, sorry for the break. That was a network disturbance. I believe everyone can hear me. So, uh, yes, a lot has been said already. So, uh, you know, for the last part, I was I was listening to where you were talking about why farmers don't keep records. They don't keep records, and you know, when in the in the quest to help them, it won't always be easy because there's no record, there's no data to check through. And that is one of the arm I just want to introduce as an extension service. So it's also an arm that we can look into to be an extension service provider in aquaculture. And being in this arm, it will make it possible to carry out extension programs planning, such as uh, 
extension programs planning that this with collection of facts, you know, knowing the number of facilities in that farm, knowing when they do their inventory and you analyze the situation of the farm, talk about the identified problem and come up with solutions. You know, these are methods and steps in extension program planning. So it's also a way in which um, value value can be added to aquaculture. I believe there are a lot of NGOs doing extension services, but then, you know, some of the issues faced so far in extension services is because of lack of technical skills and lack of trainings. People don't know how to go about this. And, you know, a lot of people, their morale is low to just do this work of extension. But it's an arm that there is money in extension service if you can go into it also. As a, as a student, you can help farmers solve their problems. You know, you are aware of new technologies, how they can do better in their farms. You can bring those ideas to them. But then... You know, the part of collecting facts and even sensitizing them about how them keeping their records is very, very important. So um, thank you very much for listening to this wonderful session today with uh, Mr. John from Ghana. We really appreciate you. Uh, we've, we've even learned a lot today on different value uh, chain in aquaculture, you know, the marketing, the post harvest services, the distribution, just as Emmanuel Adiola has listed here. Thank you very much, sir. And I believe everyone also has learned one or two things about um, aquaculture today. So, uh, yes, let me ask this question. How do you feel if aquaculture have a forum, you know, a large forum where aquaculture students and aquaculture uh, professionals can meet up, you know, they can share the ideas. People like students coming up, they can just, you know, meet mentors there. Mentors like you can just post some things on that kind of forum where they can learn and see people to channel their energy and passion to follow, you know. How did you feel if you, how will you feel if you have that kind of forum? I think that's the direction we need to go. And, um, we so are getting to the point Mr. where... John here. Yes, I can hear you. So that's the direction we need to go. And um, we are getting to the point where you are having people with the money wanting to do agriculture, but they do not know where to get very good labor All from. Right. All so right. such a forum would be a very good place to, to meet people, get people, identify where they... Places. And even with internships, these places would be very good place, um, platforms to recruit um, students for internships. Uh, now there is um, um, these African these conferences that um, go on along the world, and for a long while these conferences have always been dominated by professors and um, academic people who just come and present papers. But this is, for instance, what which is doing is to try and encourage a lot more farmer participation. And having platforms like this will help bring in industry people, bring in students into this participation, give them the needed exposure. And that, would, that is what will grow the industry. It is not the academia that would grow the industry. It is industry that would grow industry. It is um, um, knowledge transfer that would grow industry. So these platforms are very good. And I think... Um, um, let's work on getting those those platforms established. Okay, Samuel, I think we've done an hour already and uh, uh, I think we lost you due to network, but um, I'd like to say thank you to everyone who joined and partook in this session. I would, I'm, I'm glad that we connected, and um, um, I don't know if there was a way to share my email or anything. We can keep in touch, but you can always find me on Facebook and just send me um, messages on Facebook, and I, I, I'm a bit slow to respond on Facebook, but I, I would always get in touch with you and always make time to talk about fish stuff with, with you. So.
Thank you so much. Hello, Samuel. You are back. All right. All right. Thank you very much for that, sir. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, because um, even for that conference you mentioned, we are we are planning something called uh, Global Aquaculture Business Revival. Maybe before this year runs out, we are going to have that. You know, invite you, you are going to come on board again, invite a lot of speakers. So it's going to be a virtual program, you know, but it's going to be a kind of paid, but at a minimum cost virtual program that there will be registration, you know. We want a yeah. kind of virtual global aquaculture business revival where we have about 20 top speakers from Africa come to speak you know, a large days of value session, maybe three three to four days of this kind of revival, four, four hours of value session each day for five days where we have different speakers coming to, you know, a lot of value session we, we are, are going to be played out for people just to come and revive their business, to come and use new opportunities, new ideas to see, and even students will learn where we are going to have student session youth sessions and breakdowns of people that are in these value chains, how they can tell people to innovate in, in them. So that is one of the things that we are looking to, to do. So thank you very sure. much, sir. Thank you very much thank for you. joining us today. I really appreciate you. And the whole of Pescademy and Aquag really appreciate you. They are sending thank their regards to you. Uh, Thank you. Yes, sir. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Follow Pescademy both on YouTube, on, on um, Instagram, on Facebook, and on LinkedIn to learn more about this. So this will be sent, this link will be sent to your various group just to learn more about what has been said. Even though you have missed anything, you're going to get the value back. So bye for now. Bye. Okay, so I think that's the way I'm going to do it.